Hello, and thanks for attending today's KnowledgeCast webinar, Monetizing 4G Services. I'm Scott St. John, the Executive Editor of Pipeline Magazine, and I'll be moderating today's presentation. I'm joined today by Greg Coogan, Senior Marketing Manager at Convergys. But before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items. Uh, there'll be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. For those of you who are familiar with webinars, I think you'll, you'll remember how to do this, but for those of you who don't, there's a ask a question area below the presentation window. All you have to do is type your question there and click submit. I encourage you that everybody ask their questions throughout the presentation so that we have a chance to address them at the end of the session. We'll also have a brief poll during the presentation, which I'll go over at that time. And if you have any technical difficulties, please click the help button on your console to access the help guide. Uh, this presentation is available for download from your webcast console. You should see a link there to download the PDF of the presentation and a link to the full archived version of the webinar will be sent to you after today's session. Now let's get back to it. The growth of mobile data services has been explosive and shows no signs of slowing. Service providers are racing 4G to remain competitive, but not without their challenges. Bandwidth management, quality of service, policy controls, and billing are just a few of the issues a few of the issues they face. And to better understand their perspective, Convergence partnered with Leverage Media Research to conduct a global survey of service providers. The results are very interesting and in some cases surprising. Please welcome Greg Coogan, who can now share some of their findings. Good morning, Greg. Good morning, Pat. Thanks very much. And yeah, I think this is a um, great opportunity for us to see what uh, service providers are looking at when they're looking at 4G services and the kinds of concerns they have about how 4G services will evolve uh, and move uh, towards becoming a profit center for their businesses, right? So I'm going to go ahead and get right to it and start talking about our survey objectives. Uh, obviously, Convergys has a great deal of interest in 4G services and how they're going to work with communication service providers. Uh, we wanted to find out what it was communication service providers had in the way of plans for monetizing 4G, and that's probably the most important thing that we wanted to learn out of this survey. We wanted to find out how far people were along in those efforts and whether or not there were things that we could do to assist them. We wanted to also understand what kind of partnerships are driving the changes in uh, how 4G will be monetized and the kinds of things that are going to be expected to be done in the 4G networks to allow for new products and services to be created to satisfy customer demand and, of course, drive new revenues. Uh, and then we also wanted to understand what the customer experience will be like. Uh, and obviously the customer experience is going to be built on the tools that are deployed around 4G. So we wanted to ask specific questions about what the communication service providers were going to do when they're launching 4G and that way work our way backwards into the customer experience and hopefully be able to provide the kinds of tools that assist communication service providers in being successful in driving customer satisfaction with 4G. Uh, and, and the final thing for us, of course, is to use these insights as a tool to create best-in-class solutions, right? So uh, to utilize not just rating and billing, but also policy and charging control, dynamic decisioning, active mediation, offer management, and other aspects of um, the kinds of solutions that are needed to successfully create an experience that drives customer satisfaction. So those were our survey objectives, and uh, looking at the results, I think we've managed to accomplish all of them from the insight that I'm about to share. Okay. So let's take a step back before we look at the survey results and look at what's driving 4G. Uh, 4G is, uh, is rolled out in many markets already, but is effectively not fully productized in most. Uh, what's driving 4G is the data tsunami, which is unlikely to stop anytime soon. Uh, the amount of data that's being consumed on mobile networks has just about doubled every year for the last couple of years and is expected to continue to do so. And communication service providers need to look at that as both an opportunity and, to a certain degree, a potential problem, right, because there's only going to be so much uh, bandwidth, and it's essential that 
telecommunication service providers manage for scarcity and um, allow for the creation of tools to help them manage what's going on over the wireless da data networks to prevent congestion, to prevent network failures, and uh, assure customers that they have a satisfactory experience from start to finish. Now, we know that communication service providers didn't particularly monetize the 3G networks very well. Uh, they invested heavily in 3G networks, and they drove data subscriptions, obviously, with those investments. Um, but it's, it's not clear that those data subscriptions always were a great return on investment. Uh, and we know with the 4G uh, deployments, it's even more critical that they – come up with models, business models, that allow them to drive a return on their investment in both network hardware and for spectrums uh, that uh, are necessary and licenses that are necessary to deploy 4G. So the 3G experience set the stage for 4G and I believe a more aggressive approach by communication service providers towards how they were going to deploy 4G products and services. Uh, and, of course, there's a huge risk uh, of substitution, okay, with communication service providers providing very, very capable high-speed data networks. It's possible for customers to avoid using the key drivers of uh, CSP revenue, which, are, of course, are telephony and texting, uh, are you know, where most of the money has been made up until now. So voice over IP capabilities and chat to a certain degree run the risk of substituting for some revenue that would have been earned. Uh, so effectively, you could be creating a tool that is cutting off revenue to the communication service provider by giving high-quality 4G experiences. So you have to be on guard against that, and you need to have tools that help you manage that. Uh, we've already covered this, but I'll go through it again. There's a huge investment around 4G. So licenses, network, hardware, uh, all of that is very high risk when you're spending those dollars. You have to have a business plan in place for how you're going to monetize that and how you're going to drive new revenue. And, yes, to a certain degree, customer satisfaction is going to be uh, based on – keeping up with the Joneses here and deploying 4G networks that allow you to compete, okay, but it's not just good enough to compete and retain market share. You've got to have a business model in place that's actually going to pay for those substantial investments. Uh, and then, of course, creating products and services that customers want will be the key to driving 4G's promise into profits. Uh, it's not going to be uh, as, as simple as just deploying this. You have to have products that customers find attractive, easy to use, and give them tools to do things that they want to accomplish, whether it's uh, personal goals like uh, just enjoying some television from a handset or having high-speed data interactions in a business environment. It's going to be how these tools are created and the ease of use around these tools that are going to turn them into products and services that customers are going to be willing to subscribe to and ultimately pay for. Uh, and that's going to be the, the key as to whether or not you've monetized 4G correctly. If you've got subscriptions for services, if you've got partnerships that are driving revenue, then we've done a good job of monetizing 4G. So that's the background that we were looking at as we went into the survey. Okay, so um, here is a, a very good, um, little succinct understanding of what the problem has been. You know, 3G networks are being overwhelmed by the tsunami of video and broadband content, and operators are investing in 4G networks designed to handle the traffic. But they don't necessarily have the systems and the go-to market strategies in place to monetize that traffic. So that's a quote from Heavy Reading that I think summarizes it quite well. Now, of course, anytime you have a problem, you've got an opportunity as well. So at the same time, 200 operators have already committed to LTE, and only about 25 networks have actually been commercialized. So that says that there's still a lot of opportunity for companies like Convergis uh, to deliver solutions in the 4G environment, and there's certainly plenty of opportunities for the communication service providers themselves 
to experiment with business models, to create new partnerships, and to do things that make 4G something that they can be proud that they've uh, launched because it's had an excellent return on investment. All right, so here are here is another look at the 4G market drivers. On the left, you've got the growth in data, and that's a global uh, look at data growth. And that is a substantial amount of uh, what I like to call hockey stick growth. Uh, there seems to be no end in sight. And um, if you've uh, looked at what's gone on in, a, in the data world in the last couple of years, there's been an explosion of devices. There's been an explosion of services that have really driven that kind of data growth, whether it's tablets or cloud streaming of audio and video. Those products are, are really in their very early stages of deployment, and they're going, going to become much more popular over the next few years. Uh, add in, of course, the explosive growth of smartphones and um, their data usage, and there's just no end to the demand for data in the wireless space. Uh, we do know, of course, that there is technically always going to be a limit for the supply of data in the wireless space. Whether you're talking about a 3G network or a 4G network, there's only going to be so much bandwidth. There's only going to be so much spectrum, and uh, the wireless carriers are going to have to be very clever about how they manage that tool, which really drives uh, the, um, the need for the creation of very effective tools for managing 4G. Uh, on the right-hand side, you've got a look at the gap between the data traffic and the revenue that we're seeing from the customers. And you can see we've got a real issue here. The revenue is not keeping up with the data. Um, and it's critical that that revenue, you know, get to the point where it's increasing and not just staying flat. Um, because uh, successfully uh, uh, communication service providers have deployed services that customers want to pay for because they're doing things that customers demand and expect, right? So the shift to data from telephony really threatens the traditional business model and demands new ways of looking at these problems and new understandings. And that's really what we were looking for in the, uh, the 4G survey is an understanding of how far along communication service providers were in their um, deployment of those kinds of business models and, and mostly in their thinking about it because most of what we're expecting to see that's going to be very interesting in these models will probably come out next year and the year after. All right, so here's a few of the uh, creative ways uh, to monetize 4G. Uh, right now, if you have data on a smartphone, odds are you have some form of an either unlimited package or a package that gives you a certain amount of gigabytes or megabytes on a monthly basis. Uh, they usually don't uh, prevent you from going over your caps if you've got a limit. Okay, but you do end up uh, paying a uh, premium for data usage that goes over. Uh, but we believe there's an awful lot of different models that could be deployed that will allow uh, new services to be created that will help monetize 4G. Uh, for example, you can manipulate uh, different aspects of the data experience to meet customer demand. For example, uh, one of the... Um, Items here, the film buff, right, allowing customers to have a high quality of service when they're using particular sites, let's say, for example, Netflix um, or YouTube. Um, they can subscribe to a higher quality of service, and the policy control capabilities of the platform would allow that to be done successfully. Uh, other things that could be done are things like time shifting, where Customers are able to do large downloads to their handset, but set them for a time when they're getting a discounted rate or perhaps they could do it for free. So say, for example, you've got a customer who has an Android phone and they want to do a system update. Uh, you can allow them to do it overnight, for example, and do that at no charge because uh, you're not using the data system during high peak demand period. Uh, there's 
virtually no end to how these experiences can be sculpted. I don't think I need to go through everything that's on this list here. The idea is, is pretty clear that you can package these new kinds of capabilities, have them be tied to tiers, different kinds of service levels, gold, platinum, silver customers in the data range who have different levels of quality of service, and even different priority to the data network are things that can be done successfully uh, and deployed to allow the communication service provider to give different customers different experiences. Uh, if you're like me and you're a power user, you expect to just get on the network and get whatever you want whenever you want it. But there's always going to be other users out there who don't really require uh, high quality of service or the fastest speeds possible, and if they're getting discounts that allow them to get what they need but get at a lower rate, uh, then effectively you can segment the market to meet the customer demand and drive a very satisfactory experience for the customer. So these are just some of the ideas, and uh, there's more than this, I can assure you. There's going to be a lot of ways that people are going to be monetizing 4G. All right, uh, so here's the first question. What we want to find out here is, uh, have there already been service problems caused by uh, over-the-top content providers in your 4G network? And what we discovered there was the answer is yes uh, for nearly half of our respondents, which is a, a great deal of um, uh, more than you might have guessed. Uh, there there uh, certainly is going to be issues around people using things like streaming video during peak time, let's say, for example, during a sporting event. Uh, that could be something that could cause some trouble. Uh, but it does show that this problem isn't theoretical and it's not a future issue. This is a trend that is going on right now and is likely going to become worse as we see that hockey stick-like growth that we've seen in data traffic being applied to the networks, um, particularly for uh, communication service providers who have not deployed 4G. Um, this shows that they should be monitoring the policy on their network and the usage on their network quite closely because it's only a matter of time before uh, more of these problems occur. Uh, and even getting to 4G with its uh, 4X return on the amount of data that you can uh, manage on your network, it's only a matter of time before these problems begin to even overwhelm those, right? So this was a very interesting slide, and I, I personally wouldn't have predicted it would have been this high, um, but there's the result. So uh, it's, the stage is set. There is a need to manage not just policy, but the subscriber experience around over-the-top content service providers. All right. So what's pushing 4G? We wanted to ask the communication service providers directly. We didn't want to take it for granted that we knew. And here's what they told us. Uh, video is, is clearly a heavy drain on the network. I don't think that's a surprise to anybody if you're looking at something that demands uh, that you stream in real time. Uh, video is, is going to be a very attractive uh, service for customers, but it, it comes at a high bandwidth utilization rate. So video is number one. Uh, Data-enabled devices, and this is going to be smartphones and tablets that will be driving most of this, are, are close behind. And what it essentially means here is that uh, the communication service providers are, are not necessarily uh, differentiating too much what's going on. They're just looking at the devices that are driving it. So whether those are smartphones or tablets doesn't make much difference. People are using these devices for a number of things, and it's driving traffic on the network. Cloud services, as one of the other large drivers, 32%, um, I think is an up-and-coming category. If you looked at what was going on in cloud services, even a year ago, we didn't have cloud services from people like Amazon or from Apple. Uh, and that trend where content is being deployed to the cloud is only going to get worse. Uh, there, there's going to be a, a continued trend where people consume on their handheld devices 
uh, over these wireless networks and do not download the content directly to the devices. They, they stream and they use cloud services to access the, the, uh, the content in real time. So while that's only at 32% now, I think it's a safe bet to say that that's going to get significantly large over the next few years. Uh, voice over IP, I think, is, is kind of a surprising finding here that they're seeing this much traffic. I believe that's 28 percent, 29 percent. That's a substantial amount and, uh, again, likely going to get slightly larger in the near-term future uh, as customers begin to use things like Skype as ways to, to get around making phone calls internationally in other ways. Uh, What's interesting, too, is communication service first service providers really don't know what they don't know here, um, and they really don't have a very clear idea at all about what the services that will be driving these trends are over the next 12 to 18 months. And if you look at the trends over what's been deployed in the last 12 to 18 months, it's pretty obvious why that is. There's just no telling what people are going to be using tablets and smartphones for a year or two years down the road. Uh, there, there, there was no predicting how much it'd be utilized now, and it's safe to assume that the trends of unpredictability unpredict will continue. All right, so really at the heart of what's going on here is content is driving this trend towards the, uh, the data growth. Uh, and because content is driving this trend, you have to ask yourself, how are, are the communication service providers monetizing that content and utilizing that content to grow revenues? Right, so if you're looking at someone like YouTube or Google or Amazon, uh, you know, are you partnering with those uh, those companies in order to to drive revenues? You know, so are you sharing revenues with those content providers, and how do you plan to share it? Right. So, in this question. Um, we, we see that 63% of the communication service providers are sharing revenue right now from content providers used on their network. And, and that number could be any number of things. It could be uh, existing partnerships with over, over the top content providers, say Netflix, for example. Um, but it also could be content that they're partnered with to deliver on their networks that are things like ringtones, okay, or more traditional things that communication service providers have packaged and deployed in their market space, right? So uh, from that perspective, it looks like most communication service providers are already dipping their toe in this pool and will continue to do so, realize that this is uh, where the future of their own revenue interests are, and they are going to continue to grow these kinds of partnerships. Uh, if you look at the 38% number here, uh, it says essentially we're not really partnered with content providers at this time, and we're utilizing content providers passively. So content providers are delivering these services, and that's driving traffic on our networks, which drives subscriptions to data plans, okay, and obviously that's that's good revenue, okay, but it uh, doesn't really do anything that goes up and beyond that. Okay, so um, I thought the most interesting result from this slide is the final one, okay, which is we charge or plan to charge content service providers for higher service quality and preferred access. This, I think, really speaks to where the 4G monetization trends will start to go. So, for example, a communication service provider can go to a Google or Amazon and say, we would like to provide an assured quality of service to any of our subscribers who are utilizing your services on our network, and we're going to form a partnership to do that. We know that you're driving ad revenue uh, from these services, and we would like to have you pay uh, to have some level of service quality assurance regardless of what the level that the customer has subscribed to. 
uh, to make sure that the experience is as good as it can make uh, can be, excuse me, on our network. Uh, and obviously, that's in everyone's best interest. So those uh, communication service providers are the forward-thinking ones, and I believe those are the ones that are going where the majority will end up going, uh, that you know, there's going to be opportunities to partner and a willingness with those over-the-top uh, content providers to partner on those services because it's in everyone's best interest. Okay, so um, very interesting result, and, uh, you know, I think um, we're, we're, we're bound to see more of this as we go through, uh, that, that these, uh, these trends will actually shift subtly, and you'll see uh, partner efforts become a real key focus with communication service providers. All right, so we wanted to get a feeling for where most of the 4G costs are coming from. So we just asked the question directly, and Spectrum was the number one answer. So 65% of our respondents said that Spectrum was really driving what was uh, uh, their key concern about cost with 4G. But network hardware, okay, and even, you know, customer hardware were also going to be key drivers as well. And you can see there they're both tied at 40%. So there's a lot of money tied up in getting new 4G-capable handsets and 4G uh, network infrastructure in place. Uh, but Spectrum is really what they're concerned about, and they need to match these uh, costs with revenues, which is – you know, why we saw in that last slide that, that, that communication service providers are starting to move in this direction. All right. Well, here's our poll. Scott, can you uh, help out here and tell people how this works? Yes. Thanks, Greg. Uh, very interesting results from the survey so far. A very um, uh, interesting to see how service providers are looking to content providers to offset some of the costs as it relates to uh, maintaining that quality of service for uh, third-party or over-the-top applications. I thought that was uh, quite interesting. Yeah, I agree. All right. So I'm going to push a, a, a poll out here to the audience. Um, and, uh, you know, this really mammoth investment that service providers are putting into their 4G networks, um, you know, there, I guess there, there are different uh, perceptions of the return on the investment uh, that they're going to get from uh, their networks and, and systems. Um, I'd like to get your opinion, so please take a minute to answer this poll. Uh, we're asking you if you think there will be a reasonable return on investment for mobile network operators on 4G. Um, the first uh, answer is yes, there will be ROI. Uh, the sec second will be yes, but um, only if the service providers prevent erosion of their core telephony services. The third answer is yes, but only if the service providers are able to launch successful content partnerships and strategies. Uh, and then no, there will not be ROI uh, provided by 4G for mobile operators. Uh, the next answer is no, there will not be, but uh, it, it's necessary to compete, either from a CM perspective or, of course, a, um, a competitive perspective. And finally, um, there, there will never be uh, enough ROI from the 4G services outweigh the investment. So just give you a second to answer those questions, and uh, maybe I'll pose the question to Greg. What do you think here? Do you think that mobile operators will see a return on their 4G investment? Oh, I believe it's imperative and that the mobile operators are certainly um, well aware of its requirements to drive these uh, investments. So uh, to, to monetize these investments correctly, excuse me. And, yes, uh, I, I would have to say uh, I would go with the, uh, the first result, but I don't want to skew the, uh, the answers for everybody else. <laughs> sure, let's yeah. see those answers. I'll, I'll go ahead and, and push those out to the uh, audience. Excellent. All right, so we can see that 66% of the audience says yes, but only if service providers are able to launch a successful content partnership strategy. I think I agree with that. How about you, Greg? Yeah, no, I'm definitely completely on board, right? And that's all about utilizing uh, the, the tools to monetize this correctly, create these great products that we've been talking about. So um, I, I think we're all on the same page here. It's very exciting. 
Yeah, I think the other interesting result is that, that nobody uh, thinks that there's not going to be ROI or enough ROI from 4G services. Um, that the uh, the benefits far outweigh the uh, the the cost associated with uh, delivering a, a full 4G package. Yeah, no, that is very interesting, right? Because I would think there would be a pessimist or two out there that would see this as a a, a half full kind of opportunity where you have to do it, um, but it's not clear that it's going to pay off in the long term, right? But what this tells me is is that most people who uh, you know respond to the survey like what we saw in our survey as well, realize that uh, it's completely necessary to have a plan in place and, you know, content partnerships are going to be a real key way to do that. Absolutely, absolutely. And, of course, policy control is also critical here. So I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, move off the poll and, and jump into our, our next slide here for you. Back to you. Yeah, absolutely. All right, great. Okay, so uh, I don't have to tell everybody on this call if you've been involved as a uh, communication service provider, uh, policy control is a very hot topic. And traditionally, policy control has been the domain of the network folks and less the domain of the marketing folks and the IT folks who work at the communication service providers. Uh, policy control has been about uh, preventing problems on your network. Say, for example, you've got uh, some rogue device uh, that is utilizing all the bandwidth or, you know, just somebody who is spending all their time downloading huge movies off the Internet or something along those lines, and you need to control them. That's been a traditional use of policy control, okay? Um, and and that's fine. Obviously, that's going to continue in the future as well, uh, but it's going to have to become more subtle than that, and it's going to have to become a, a tool that can be used to sculpt great products, right? So, uh, so looking at these results, uh, do you have a 4G data policy control platform in place? And the answer is, of yes for 17% is um, is very low. So most uh, people probably responding to this uh, could have interpreted it either of two ways. If they haven't rolled out 4G, then you know, they may have just answered no here. Okay, but if they've rolled out 4G and they don't have a data policy control platform in place, then they are certainly planning to add one, right? So if they answered no there, then they went ahead uh, and answered yes, we know that we have to uh, put in uh, a policy control platform in the short to medium term in order to effectively monetize 4G. Right, so uh, policy control is going to become a real tool for sculpting the customer experience and for driving revenue with OTT partnerships. It's not just about limiting access and throttling. Uh, so the, the message is pretty clear that that's very important in the long term. All right, so the next slide. Okay, are uh, communication service providers ready to cash in on 4G? Uh, you know, does your billing system support the services you need to monetize 4G directly? Uh, the answer is clearly no, right? So 61% responding that they didn't feel they had the tools with their legacy systems in order to monetize 4G well, and I, I don't think this is a big surprise. Um, you know, so two-thirds are going to be ready to uh, fix that problem, right? Uh, the answer for people who said no, clearly, you know, it's 50-50 here. So those respondents are split. They know that they're going to have to do something that allows them to rate and manage and bill for events that take place in the data sphere outside of the traditional network events that they rate and bill for. So if you're looking at, uh, you know, we, we bill for texts or we bill for phone calls, that's no longer the world that uh, is, is going to be the domain of the BSS in the future. It's going to be about uh, rating for bundles of certain kinds of uh, megabyte access, for example, to films or to streaming music. Those are the kinds of events that are going to be needed to be rated, uh, to be billed against balances and prepaid packages, uh, the kind of sophistication that clearly um, communication service providers don't feel that they've got at the moment. 
right? So um, this says there's there's a lot of opportunity for improvement, and most CSPs are aware of that, and they're already heading in that direction, which is a great result. All right, so partnering with content providers, right? So 83% either have partnerships that ensure higher quality of service or plan on having them in the near-term future, okay? So that's a great result, too. That says that it's very clear that managing the QoS can be productized, and it can be a product that works in both directions. In other words, you can uh, sell that product to over-the-top content providers, and you can sell that product to the people that utilize the over-the-top content providers. So if you're creating tiers that are based on the uh, customer subscribable, subscriber profile and managing that within the policy and charging control platform, then um, that's a, a wonderful way to create revenue and satisfy your customers and give them essentially what they want and what they're willing to pay for. Okay, but this, this slide and this result also says that it's going to go in the other direction and that somebody like a, a streaming video provider or a streaming music provider is going to see the value in saying, yes, I will partner with that wireless service pro provider to be assured that the experience is satisfactory because that drives my revenue as well. So I think that's a very exciting result. Okay, um, the trend is that these uh, these kinds of partnerships are going to become more and more prevalent, uh, and who knows what they're going to look like in a few years, right? So so maybe there will be things like commercials that, um, that some commercials come via the wireless operator, the CSP, okay, and some commercials come with from the um, the uh, OTT provider, something that's similar to what you might see on, say, a cable network, where occasionally you'll see cable ads for, that are driven from your cable company um, mixed in with the ads that are driven from uh, the the content provider, in that case, the network. So those kinds of possibilities are there for monetizing what's going on in 4G, and I think that's a very exciting result. Okay, so quality of service for over-the-top content providers. The vast majority of uh, communication service providers do not use their policy control to manage quality of service now, but they are certainly planning to do that in the future. Okay, so throttling or other policy control will likely be something that content providers will need to factor into their plans. So the vast majority are saying, we are, we know this is coming, uh, we are preparing for this, we, we realize that this is the wave of the future and is inevitable, right, that we're going to have to cre create great customer experiences by creating partnerships that uh, drive revenue and assure quality of service that's based on whether or not uh, partners and customers themselves are willing to pay for those levels of quality of service, which I think, again, is a very exciting result. We see the trend here is pretty clear. Okay, so do most CSBs see 4G productization as a growth opportunity? Uh, and I think the answer is that is clearly yes. Which of the following services do you plan to offer via your 4G networks? Video is definitely very high on the list. Uh, family plans, right, the ability to share minutes and guarantee controls by a master unit uh, user, excuse me, is, is, is a close second. Uh, audio streaming, a th close third. Okay, corporate plans with access controls, uh, the ability to, for example, manage uh, access to particular websites or particular over-the-top content providers for people who are on our corporate plans. These are the kinds of services that are going to be expected by high-value users, and it looks pretty clear that the uh, communication service providers are planning on offering most of these things as an extension of what they do already for their enterprise and for their high-dollar value uh, family plan uh, subscribers. Um, they're, they're planning on taking that, um, what they're doing with telephony today, and extending that into the uh, the 4G realm, 
So say, for example, if I've got a child who's on my family account and I only want to have them access a family package of family-friendly kind of video from their handset, then those are the kinds of tools that I might utilize and sell um, in my in my my network as a communication service provider. And if, if I'm the subscriber, that would be what I would buy. So there's lots of plans in this place. Uh, I don't think this is a big surprise as a result, but I think it's it's very interesting that there's a logical extension from the legacy kind of services that have been offered into the new services that are going to be offered in the 4G world. Okay, our wholesale relationships important to business plans to support 4G investment, and this is an overwhelming result. The vast majority of uh, CSPs are planning to utilize wholesale as a tool. And what I thought was interesting here is it's going to be bulk access to wholesale that drives the greatest amount of this new uh, revenue. That was identified as the most important relationship in wholesale with machine-to-machine uh, -machine and MVNOs as seconds. So clearly there's, there's plans to sell data in a wholesale fashion and uh, who that wholesale customer is going to be is going to be very different market to market. Uh, but there is uh, no end, as we've already discussed, to the growth of data. So where these uh, data customers are going to be coming from um, isn't particularly clear, but I, I don't think these CSPs are particularly worried about that because there's more and more devices utilizing these kinds of capabilities all the time, whether it's machine-to-machine, uh, -machine, traditional kinds of things like security or management of trucking fleets, things along those lines. Um, again, there's just no end to what's going to be offered. Uh, and I, I think that um, wholesale is going to be very important as a way for CSPs to sell their excess capacity and come up with business models that allow them to compete at multiple levels. So clearly CSPs agree here too. So is 4G a necessity for customer satisfaction? And again, vast majority said yes here. So while CSPs see it as a necessity for customer sat, um, it, it isn't critical for everyone. Uh, I think that CSPs are seeing it as a must-have product in order to keep up with the Joneses. Okay, but um, uh, and, and clearly customers are going to like the higher speed, the less data uh, congestion, uh, but there will be a long-term expectation that um, there will be an increase in personalized services from 4G as well. So I think that will help drive customer satisfaction as well. It's not going to be just about uh, offering these new services. It's going to be doing new things for your customers via these new services also. All right, is net neutrality an issue? And this is obviously a result that's going to be based on your location. So if you're in the EU, you have different net neutrality rules than you have in the United States, for example. Uh, but here we're seeing the CSPs saying that they're expecting a large or a limited uh, impact of net neutrality for 87% of what's happening on their networks. So that's a pretty significant impact. And net neutrality rules obviously need to be well understood and uh, exercised in accordance with local rec regulations. Uh, and you're going to need to have a good policy and charging control platform in order to do that well. Um, and you know, clearly that's something that the communication service providers are keeping in mind as they're sculpting these, these propositions. Unlimited data, is it dead yet? And no is, is the answer. Um, it, yes, it's nearly 50-50 here saying, will you offer unlimited data to your 4G subscribers? Right, so there's uh, going to be an opportunity there for 4G subscribers to, to uh, take advantage of unlimited data, at least in the short term. But you can expect that unlimited data in 4G will run into some of the trouble that it ran into uh, in the 3G world, where it became less and less feasible. And as it became less feasible, the CSPs withdrew it. Right, so um, the 4G monetization engine 
okay, that drives this experience from Convergence's perspective is the policy and charging control capability. This, this model is based on a 3GPP standard, and essentially what we're showing here is that there is uh, a, a, a segment that is controlled by the CSP between the subscriber and the greater Internet world uh, that allows for the creation of experiences that involve active mediation, the rating and billing capability, the subscriber profiles, and the uh, services that they've elected to subscribe to, the tiers that they've chosen for quality of services, and things along those lines, in association with the policy and charging rules function and the policy and charging enforcement function. So those tools together are necessary to create the kinds of experiences that the CSPs are looking for to allow them to monetize 4G and to manage those interactions with the customer um, in real time. So say, for example, a customer wants to upgrade their quality of service on demand. Um, they're uh, wanting to watch a video of, say, a sporting event, and they you know, want to have priority access or they want to get faster speeds in order to do so for a specific segment of time. Customers are going to want to utilize those kinds of capabilities, and CSPs are going to want to monetize those kinds of capabilities, and a policy and charging control platform is at the heart of getting that done. So we see those kinds of the monetization opportunities in a lot of different kinds of products and services, and the 4G monetization engine is really what going to be what drives that. And uh, I think what we've seen in these results is that the CSPs we queried agree, okay, that this is the kind of service that they're going to be adding more and more uh, to what they've, uh, they've got for their rating and billing platforms. It can be an adjunct solution that runs – side by side with a legacy solution or it could be something that uh, it does is manages the entire thing but policy and charging control engines like the one that we've uh, we've drawn here are going to be what make all this kind of monetization possible thanks Greg all right so that brings us to our question and answer sessions. If you haven't submitted a, a question through the panel, please uh, feel free to do so now. We, we have had a few come in that we'll, we'll address. But uh, also, uh, Greg's contact information is here on this slide. If you want more information about Convergis or their recent survey, um, feel free to reach out to him directly. Unfortunately, Tony wasn't able to join us this morning due to a travel hiccup. But um, let's go to the questions. The, the first one is, Greg, uh, why will 4G be a driver for customer satisfaction? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I think the, uh, the answer to that has to do with um, the ability to create experiences for customers that are, are based on the customer needs, right? So, um, for example, I, I don't know if everybody can relate to this experience, but when you see how traffic is managed in parts of the world now, like say, for example, in London, um, they're charging a fee for people to drive into downtown London. In Miami, if you drive on the, the highway, they've got a, a, a toll road specifically for people who want to go fast, okay, and the road is not a toll road for people who are happy going slow. Uh, and those are those are models that I think are going to be very similar to what we're seeing in the data world in the near future, where customers are able to have uh, the kinds of experiences they expect uh, based on uh, segmentation and creation of tiers. So if if I want to always be in, in the fast lane, um, then I think 4G is going to allow me to, to have those kinds of experiences. Um, and, you know, that it's going to, to drive customer satisfaction by just basically getting what I expect, which is um, high quality of service all the time. So I think 4G is more than just about keeping up with the Joneses. It's, a, it's about creating new products and services that match those customer needs. And if you're doing that and if you're out competing other communication service providers by doing that, then, you know, clearly you're going to be uh, chosen by uh, customers 
versus other people who don't do that. So I think the answer to that is clearly yes. Yeah, very interesting. And, and another question came in that I, that I think ties into this well is, is you know, on one hand, we have the huge potential of 4G bandwidth and all of the differentiated service offerings that could be a part of that. But as operators try to manage fair usage and, and, and manage their bandwidth and, and network usage properly, um, you know, do you think that those types of initiatives will have an impact on the customer experience? Yeah, I think it's inevitable, right, because, uh, again, you know, looking forward at least a few years out, we will get to some degree of network scarcity, right, and <clears throat> um, you'll also be deploying new uh, interactive capabilities because uh, the beauty of the smartphone is virtually anything that you want to do with a customer can be done from the handset. So if you've got a, a customized application for self-care management, for example, you can do things like uh, a turbo boost for a set period of time and have the customer acknowledge that, yeah, this is something that I want to do, and, you know, I put my pin in to do the authorization for that, uh, and, uh, you know, I, I'm willing to incur a small charge to do it, right? So uh, it essentially allows customers to choose the kind of experience that they're willing to pay for, and that's critical for communication service providers as they um, figure out how they're going to monetize this kind of experience. Absolutely, absolutely, and I think we're – already seeing some service providers roll out that type of service and mm -hmm. um, monetizing that on the customer side as well as the content provider side is a, is a, is a big opportunity and, and will continue to be. Yeah, I agree. Um, what other revenue models uh, do you guys see? Uh, a question came in from the audience here. Um, are you seeing from the survey any specific types of revenue models taking shape? Yeah, we didn't, unfortunately – follow up on the question about the partnerships for a lot more detail. We asked that question um, in, uh, I think, three different directions, but it, essentially what we were looking for is um, would communication service providers be willing to share some of their revenue, okay, or would they um, ask the over-the-top content providers um, to um, to to pay them essentially for utilizing some of some of the bandwidth on their network, and you know we did get results that show that there's going to be a little bit of everything, right? And I think that's that's what's going to be very interesting in the next few years is watching how those monetization models develop, right? Because uh, this is all greenfield stuff right now, and it's not clear how it's all going to work. But if you look at monetization models, like the monetization model that um, I already um, discussed around cable television, for example, you'll start to see some of those models come to the fore because they work, right? There is the opportunity to share revenue, to, um, to jointly uh, benefit from access, right? And that's what communication service providers have. They are managing the pipe between the OTT people and the ultimate customers. So they've got the ability to insert themselves into that value chain and create different kinds of partnerships that drive things, right? So sometimes it's, it's going to be the customer who's paying for those services. Sometimes it's the over-the-top content provider who's paying for those services. But ultimately, it's going to um, create a sustainable revenue model by having everybody pitch in a little bit is what I personally believe. So uh, it's going to be really exciting to watch. Yeah, I think that was surprising from the results, too, that the communication service providers that you surveyed were actually um, it seemed very forthright in the fact that they were going to share revenue across that value chain. And then probably a little more uh, almost uh, timidly um, offset some of their costs in terms of quality of service for over-the-top providers. That's yeah, right. agreed. Uh, you, you know, if they're reaching into their pocket, that's always a, su a surprise, right? Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think they're, they're seeing that there's benefit and in, in, uh, they're doing that in the long term. So I think that's a really exciting result. Um, I understand that there is a white paper that's going to be made available. Can, can you, you mention that and, and how that might be available for the audience? 
Uh, yes. As a matter of fact, um, you know, we will be doing an email blast to everybody on the audience uh, who signed up, uh, and they'll be getting a white paper uh, summary of the results. Uh, and, of course, the slides for this presentation um, are available for download right away, right? Um, in addition, there's a, a white paper that um, – uh, we that Convergis has issued on 4G monetization that's available on the Convergis Smart Solutions site um, that dovetails very well with the information that we've got here. So there's a lot of information about this that uh, that we're happy to share. Excellent, and and there is a, a 4G microsite that Convergis has uh, put together that that is now available to you. It's been pushed out to the audience, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, that brings us to the top of the hour. Thank you, Greg and Convergis. Um, and any questions that weren't answered on this uh, live session um, will be followed up via email. And uh, thanks again, everybody, and have a great rest of the day.